Hanoi, August 1945. The man who calls himself Ho Chi Minh, he who enlightens, is greeted by delirious crowds when he arrives with his guerrilla forces after Japan's defeat. Smaller crowds greet the French returning to their colony. Ho proclaims Vietnam's independence in September 1945. Years before, this same man left his homeland and rented a dress suit and derby hat to petition President Wilson at Versailles in 1919. Ho pleaded for independence for Vietnam. No one listened to him except the French communists. He became a founding member of their party in 1920, but he never lost sight of his main goal, Vietnamese independence. In the summer of 1946, in Napoleon's castle at Fontainebleau, he seeks to obtain from the French full independence for his country. Paris treats the former photo retoucher with full honors, but behind the glittering exteriors lurk the realities of post-war France, a weak government at home and strongly entrenched colonial interests overseas. Until the end, Ho hopes for an agreement. Last-minute talks with French overseas minister Marius Moutet fail. November 1946, French guns hit the port of Haiphong. A few days later, Ho's guerrillas in turn attack the French. Ho goes into the jungle. The Indochina War is on, and it is to last eight blood-filled years. Colonel Paul J. Hallowell, former OSS man, now a Miami lawyer. When he, when he came up and asked for arms, uh, there were certain questions we usually asked, and one question that I asked him, and I asked him every time, was, who was he going to shoot? And he said he was going to shoot Japanese which was fine, and we would ask the question, well, what about the French? And to give the devil his due, he would never commit that he would not use the arms against the French at some point. Had he made that commitment, he possibly might have gotten more arms than he did. When American arms do go to Indochina, it is 1950, after Korea, and they go to the French. Ho and his cabinet must hide from roving bombers in a deep mine shaft. The French know that the enemy hides below them in the jungle. But Ho's fighters have in their favor their mastery of the art of guerrilla warfare, and above all, their fanaticism. In a final attempt to trap the elusive Viet Minh, the French decide to tempt Ho's forces to fight in the open. As bait, they offer the elite of the French troops in Indochina in an isolated valley called Dien Bien Phu. Spurred on by Ho, the Viet Minh forces accept the French challenge. The experts had predicted that no one could drag artillery pieces and tens of thousands of shells through roadless jungles and across swollen rivers. The Viet Minh take the French position after 56 days of continuous assault. As the battle unfolds, Ho sends a message to his troops. The enemy will struggle with all his might. We must therefore double our efforts and be resolved to win total victory. Dien Bien Phu has fallen, and the French now are ready to talk. They agree to a peace conference in Geneva, May 1954. CBS News correspondent Alexander Kendrick was there. There were two conferences at Geneva. First, the one on Korea, which got nowhere, and then the one on Indochina. Dulles left before the second one even began, and the United States became only an observer and didn't sign the final agreement. Molotov, the Soviet foreign minister, made the Viet Minh accept the 17th parallel as the ceasefire line, even though it meant giving up territory to the South. The Geneva agreements leave the victorious Ho Chi Minh in control of North Vietnam. The weak, newly independent state of South Vietnam survives with American support. Three quarters of a million North Vietnamese flee to the South. Reunification elections to be held by July 1956 under the terms of the Geneva Accords never materialize. Each side will accuse the other of breaking the Accords first. When Ho calls for the liberation of the South, black garb militia loyal to Ho will spread guerrilla warfare below the 17th parallel. When it opened 137 years ago, the Suez Canal was called the modern wonder of the world. A 160 kilometer long channel cutting through the desert between the Mediterranean and Red Seas. A voyage from Europe to India was shortened from six months to less than six weeks. 
For Imperial Britain, the canal became a superhighway for its expanding empire. London now easily linked to its possessions in East Africa, India, the Far East, and its colony in Australia. When Egyptian nationalists rebelled against the foreigners, it was English troops who took the lead in quelling the riots, declaring the country to be an indispensable possession of the British Empire. For nearly 75 years, Egypt tried in vain to evict the British. It's not until July 1956 that one man will finally succeed. Gamal Abdul Nasser. Nasser is a former army colonel who has come to the port city of Alexandria to celebrate the fourth anniversary of a military coup. The popular rebellion toppled the monarchy and then pushed Britain's colonial army out of Egypt. We are not giving in to the colonialists, Nasser tells Egyptians. We are restoring our rights. The canal has been taken without a shot being fired. It was a bombshell, of course, absolute bombshell. We were very happy, uh, to tell you the truth, because it was the right of the Egyptians to do that. Uh, you know, the Suez Canal was Egyptian. It's the most important waterway in the world, the conduit through which Europe receives more than 75% of its oil. It gave a tremendous sense of shock, because Britain had not yet really genuinely appreciated in the gut uh, the full effects of the Second World War in depriving Britain essentially of the empire. Nasser denounces Western imperialism in radio broadcasts heard across the Middle East. <laughs> At the Portsmouth Naval Base, Britain prepares for the worst in the Suez Crisis. Part of her mothball fleet, idle since World War II, is hastily made ready for action. The crisis is heating up. Nasser is receiving massive military aid from the Soviet Union. He believes he is safe from British attack, but he is ignoring an enemy much closer and much more concerned with his growing military power, Israel. By the fall of 1956, Eden's generals report that their invasion force is ready. They want to attack now before winter sets in. But Eden is still trying to rally support for his war effort. Increasingly, the British public is turning against him. He is about to give up when the arrival of a secret partner suddenly gives him a deadly new set of options. A French Air Force general outlines the scheme. Uh, and he had invented the following scenario, that Israel should attack Egypt. Thereupon, Britain and France, who had forces in the neighborhood, should say, uh, we cannot allow this kind of war because it will uh, interfere with the Suez Canal um, passage, which is absolutely vital for the whole world's commerce, and therefore we are going to intervene and hold the two, the two countries apart. He must have been immediately delighted to be apparently off the hook, um, because here was a, 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 scam, a scheme worked out with the French and Israelis, and if they all played their part in this play, um, he seemed to think it would be all right. For the plan to succeed, the pact must be kept secret. Logan returns to London with the secret agreement and gives Eden a copy of the signed document. We returned late that night and took the document to him in number 10. 
And his immediate reaction was, oh my God, I never expected anything to be signed. Eden orders all the British copies destroyed and asks the French to do the same. They refuse. David Ben-Gurion has returned to Israel and put his copy away for safekeeping. On November 29th, Israel sticks to the script outlined in the secret plan and launches a lightning attack across the Sinai Desert. The UN now faces the biggest challenge of its history as it searches for ways to keep the crisis from blowing up into a third world war. On November 5th, Anglo-French paratroops invade the Suez Canal. Paratroops thought that they could pull it off on the 5th. The British land in Port Said. Port Fouad was captured by the French, um, but on the, on the British side, uh, there was some resistance. With British and French troops fighting on Egyptian territory, the crisis could scarcely become more dangerous, but it does. On November 5th, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev steps in. Britain, France and Israel are warned that Russia will not stand idly by and watch its ally, Egypt, destroyed. He said to the world that don't be surprised if a consequence of your actions is that nuclear weapons will fall on London and Paris. The world holds its breath. Could the Soviets be preparing for war with the West? Uh, this was the first time they had ever made a nuclear threat. And he didn't make it because he assumed it would work. He made it because he felt he had no alternative. The world was waiting to hear what he was going to do for his ally. That moment I did think this is really going to be uh, the Third World War. There was suspicion, you know, that uh, uh, nuclear uh, weapons would be launched on London and uh, if uh, Eden didn't back down, that was what was going to happen. Eisenhower launches his U-2 spy planes to look for signs that Soviet troops are mobilizing. Nothing can be found. Well, the dirty little secret in Moscow was that they didn't have any weapons that could reach London and Paris. Britain is now begging America for loans to stay afloat. Eisenhower says no. the main British assault force hits the beach, the fighting is over. The war was in fact over by the time the bulk of British troops landed. On the 8th of November, the beginning of the world's first UN peacekeeping mission. The humiliation is complete when in the dead of night, British troop ships quietly slip out of Port Said. In England, demonstrators are demanding Eden's resignation. Now in poor health, and with support within his own party disappearing, Eden makes his decision. Can I just say, thank you very much for all your kindness to me, all of you, during my period of office. On January 9th, less than 25 days after he accepted a ceasefire, Prime Minister Anthony Eden leaves politics forever. But he will never admit to the secret deal with Israel. And it is not until 1996 that the copy of the secret pact Ben-Gurion took home with him is made public. When 
Nasser regains control of the canal, he destroys the statue of the Lesseps. A clear message of Egypt's contempt for Western imperialism. President Eisenhower meets the Washington Press Corps at a time of grave world crisis. Within a month of Britain's withdrawal from Suez, Eisenhower does what he said he'd never do. Commit U.S. troops to the Middle East. You'll not go to war. In the following years, much of the Arab world accuses America of replacing Britain with its own brand of imperialism. This is battered Budapest under the brutal Russian boot. Soviet tanks roam the streets amid the ruins they made as communist secret police hunt down heroic freedom fighters. Here for all the world to see is grim evidence of the brutality and savagery with which the red tanks blasted a defenseless people and their city. Two Budapest cameramen risked execution to make these pictures and smuggle them out of Hungary. 25,000 Hungarians are dead. Budapest is ravaged, but the communist masters cannot crush a proud people. Defiantly, they chant, we shall be free. Refusing to live under Soviet tyranny, refugees stream into Austria. They flee with little more than the clothes on their backs. At journey's end, they can smile again. Border guards beckon the refugees on as they brave the quicksand of an icy quagmire. The Russians have blockaded highways and destroyed bridges in a desperate effort to halt the mass exodus. But in six weeks, 120,000 Hungarians slip out of their troubled homeland, fleeing the black night of Soviet terror. At the American Embassy in Vienna, crowds wait in the streets for admission to the United States. President Eisenhower offers asylum to 21,000. By January 1st, all 21,000 refugees will have reached the United States in the biggest air-sea mercy operation in our nation's history. Under the stars and stripes, these Hungarians can work and wait and hope for the day when Hungary will be free. Ladies and gentlemen, we are bringing to you the most important story of this century, mankind's breakthrough into space. For the first time, mankind has reached for the stars and found them within his grasp. The Westinghouse Broadcasting Company filmed the first motion pictures of the Russian satellite. You are about to witness this historic event. It is I see it. about in the center of the screen in the lower third. You got we, the we moved the camera. The camera. The camera was moved there. Now we start over again. Now we start over again, and the stars are in the background. This is a photograph of a monitor screen. Right, There's the object. Across the bottom. Now, that, across the bottom. Remarkable. About uh, yeah, in the middle of the screen now, I would say. Yeah, that is wonderful, isn't it? Suddenly, a future in space seemed possible. And now back tonight and trying for $20,000 are Eddie Hodges, the 10-year-old schoolboy, and his partner, Major John Glenn, Jr., the Marine Corps jet pilot. Uh, what do you think of the Russian satellite, which is circling the Earth at 18,000 miles <laughs> per hour? Well, to say the least, George, they're out of this world, but... <laughs> uh, this is uh, really quite an advancement for not only the Russians, but for international science. I think we'd all agree on that. It's the first time anybody has ever been able to get anything out that far in space and keep it there for any length of time. And this is probably the first step toward space travel or moon travel, something we'll probably run into maybe in Eddie's lifetime here at least. <laughs> Eddie, would you like to take a trip to the moon? No, sir, I like it fun right here. <laughs> My friends, tonight I want to talk to you about the situation, dangerous to peace, which has developed in the Formosa Straits in the Far East. 
My purpose is to give you its basic facts and then my conclusions as to our nation's proper course of action. To begin, if the Chinese communists have decided to risk a war, it is not because Kamoi itself is so valuable to them. They have been getting along without Kamoi ever since they seized the China mainland nine years ago. If they have now decided to risk a war, it can only be because they and their Soviet allies have decided to find out whether threatening war is a policy from which they can, they can make big gains. Today, the Chinese communists announce, repeatedly and officially, that their military operations against Kamoi are preliminary to attack on Formosa. So it is clear that the Formosa Straits Resolution of 1955 applies to the present situation. If the present bombardment and harassment of Kamoi should be converted into a major assault with which the local defenders could not cope, then we would be compelled to face precisely the situation that Congress visualized in 1955. There will be no retreat in the face of armed aggression, which is part and parcel of a continuing program of using armed forces to conquer new regions. Some misguided persons have said that Kamoi is nothing to become excited about. They said the same about South Korea, about Vietnam, about Lebanon. Now I assure you that no, more, no American boy will ever be asked by me to fight just for Kamoi. But those who make up our armed forces, and I believe the American people as a whole, do stand ready to defend the principle that armed force shall not be used for aggressive purposes. We will not, in these talks, be a party to any arrangements which would prejudice rights of our ally, the Republic of China. We know by hard experiences that the Chinese communist leaders are indeed militant and aggressive. They said that they were entitled to Formosa and the offshore islands and that if they used armed force to get them, that was purely a civil war and that the United Nations had no right to concern itself. They claimed also that the attack by the communist North Koreans on South Korea was civil war and that the United Nations and the United States were aggressors because they helped South Korea. They said the same about their attack on Vietnam. I feel sure that these pretexts will never deceive or control world opinion. The fact is that communist Chinese hostilities in the Formosa Straits do endanger world peace. I do not believe that any rulers, however aggressive they may be, will flout efforts to find a peaceful and honorable solution, whether it be by direct negotiation or through the United Nations. However, the present situation, though serious, is by no means desperate or hopeless. There is not going to be any appeasement. I believe there is not going to be any war. This has not been the first test for us and the free world. Probably it will, be not, it will not be the last. But as we meet each test with courage and unity, we contribute to the safety and the honor of our beloved land and to the cause of a just and lasting peace. The CIA knew it as their invulnerable spy plane. The U-2 was a phantom top secret and a masterpiece of aviation technology, it was designed to fly over Soviet territory undetected, taking unauthorized surveillance pictures at altitudes that were unreachable to Soviet missiles and fighter planes. But on May 1, 1960, a Soviet surface-to-air missile targeted and took a U-2 out of the sky in what was to become a renowned incident that would affect international relations and policy in the US and Soviet Union for many years to come. I remember the commander turning to me and saying I should be ready to engage live targets. Naturally the tension was huge. We didn't know for sure that the plane was just an intelligence aircraft. And what if it carried a nuclear bomb on board? When it came down, all of us were triumphant. 
Once the plane was hit, the pilot, Francis Gary Powers, managed a dramatic bailout and was captured shortly after parachuting down on Russian soil. At 5.36 in the morning, Moscow time, an American plane crossed our border and went on with its flight deeper into the Soviet land. The government declared that the aggressor knew what he was doing as he trespassed on someone else's territory. This is why it was necessary to act and to shoot down the plane. But Khrushchev had purposely admitted any information about the pilot. The US, assuming the pilot dead and the plane destroyed, issued a detailed statement claiming it was a weather plane that had crashed after the pilot had experienced oxygen difficulties. But it was a risky deceit. What the Americans didn't realize was that not only was Powers still alive and being interrogated, but that many parts of the U-2 spy plane were still essentially intact, including espionage equipment and a surveillance camera from which photos were later developed. Now, the incident set U.S.-Soviet relations back greatly and was a humiliation for the Eisenhower government, who had been caught out lying. Powers was eventually given a 10-year sentence for espionage, but was exchanged for a member of the KGB a few years later in a high-profile spy swap. On his return home, Powers, due in large part to the significant amount of misinformation given out from both sides during his time in captivity, was given far from a hero's welcome. Well, when my father returned home, uh, he was shocked to discover that there were editorials written in the press that he had defected, he had landed the plane intact, he had spilled, uh, or they, uh, they thought that he had spilled his guts and told the Soviets everything he knew. So to him, this was a little bit of a shock, and he was disappointed at the time that the American government didn't do more to help set the record straight and get rid of the misinformation. Well, 50 years on and the incident continues to intrigue, a real-life tale of spies, lies, and what was ultimately a memorable Soviet success. Sarah Firth, RT, Moscow. throws the bulk of its military manpower into the Algerian rebellion, which daily assumes the proportions of total war. Flying columns fan out through the country, which on all sides has become a target for hit-and-run attacks by native guerrillas, and rounding up guerrillas has kept almost 400,000 of France's best troops pinned down. Chief sufferers in the raids have been the outlying farm communities, many of which have been raised by fire and their operators slaughtered. Whole factories have been put to the torch, even as France builds up its military establishment to peak strength. Armed depots now dot the whole Algerian landscape, as French forces are deployed to provide swift striking power in a war of attrition whose end is not in sight. March 6, 1957, the Gold Coast became the first black African colony to gain independence from colonial Britain. Renamed Ghana, this newly independent nation would be led by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Nkrumah was celebrated as a hero, a visionary who would show Africa the way to independence. And while Ghana led the way, other African nations would soon follow. Between 1958 and 1964, 26 African nations gained their freedom from colonial rule. It was the end of an era. A new generation of African nationalists had come to power. Men like Nkrumah in Ghana, Ahmed Sekouture in Guinea, and Patrice Lumumba in what was then the Belgian Congo. For Africa, it was a period of great optimism. Nkrumah's hopes for colonial independence had begun during World War II. United States President Franklin Roosevelt 
had secured from British Prime Minister Winston Churchill a promise that all nations of the world would be allowed to chart their own political course. It was the beginning of the end for European colonialism. As World War II drew to a close, the United Nations was formed. It would provide a forum where nations could meet to address issues of mutual concern. Among the founding principles of this new organization was a declaration of support for political freedom and independence. The colonial powers of Europe vastly underestimated the power this would have. When I first joined the UN in 1945, I was astonished, at, particularly the British Foreign Office, and people would say, well, decolonization is a small matter, you know, 100 years, 150 years, maybe. Well, actually, it took 20. In 1948, in the Gold Coast's capital, Accra, disgruntled ex-soldiers demonstrated for fair pay for their wartime service. A number were shot and killed by colonial police, sparking riots across the country. One of those imprisoned without trial in the aftermath of the rioting was Kwame Nkrumah. He had just returned from England to be General Secretary of the United Gold Coast Convention Party. Nkrumah's arrest instantly transformed him into a national hero. The Gold Coast was one of the richest colonies in Africa. Diamonds, gold and cocoa were its main exports. Its early history was dominated by the slave trade. Nkrumah himself came from a small village near the old slaving forts of Elmina. In the 1930s, he managed to make his way to the United States to study. While in the U.S., he was influenced by African-American scholars and black nationalist pioneers. At about the same time as Nkrumah was gaining prominence in the Gold Coast, Ahmed Sekouture was emerging as the leader in the French colony of Guinea, also in West Africa. Ahmed Sekouture, c'est Dieu qui l'a donné à la Guinée. Et Ahmed Sekouture a commencé la lutte d'indépendance, d'émancipation du peuple d'Afrique, du peuple de Guinée, très tôt. Il a d'abord choisi la section syndicale pour s'élever contre l'injustice coloniale. A mineral-rich territory of 5 million people, Guinea had been a French possession since 1891. Like the Gold Coast, it had a history of slavery and it was still being tolerated by the French. N'oubliez pas que la Guinée Ça, c'est quelque chose qu'on ignore généralement. Quand ces coutourées arrivent au pouvoir en 1957, elle a encore un quart de sa population composée d'esclaves. A fiery union leader, Sekouture built a huge personal following by championing the cause of the downtrodden, including women. Nous, femmes, nous étions des esclaves du colonialisme. Et nos maris, nos fils et nos époux qui étaient là étaient en même temps les esclaves. Et comme la tradition africaine voudrait que la femme se soumette à l'homme, nous, esclaves déjà, nous étions encore esclaves de l'esclave. <rire> C'est vous dire que c'était ardu. Donc, l'arrivée d'un rassembleur de masse comme le président Mercedes était la bienvenue. Donc, très tôt, elles l'ont suivi, elles ont milité dans les syndicats. Elles ont milité au sein du parti. But just as African nationalists were gaining power, another global conflict was developing that would have a huge influence on their destinies. The uh, significance of the, the Cold War to Africa is something that plays out throughout the 1940s and 1950s. There are all sorts of spins on this. One of them is the attempt by colonial powers to uh, maintain the, the importance of colonialism in terms of world, world opinion. On July the 5th, 1962, 
And after 132 years of French colonial rule, Algeria was declared an independent nation. The joy of its people was hard to contain. For the path to independence had been a bloody eight-year war that had led to the loss of up to a million Algerian lives. That war was prolonged by a breakaway group of hardliners known as the Organization of the Secret Army, or the OAS, which brought France itself to the verge of civil war in its attempt to keep Algeria French at all costs. The OAS was a major threat. It wasn't a sideshow. This was a war within a war. And indeed, de Gaulle was almost killed several times in direct attacks. The activities of the OAS against both French and Algerian targets accentuated the intercommunal tensions in Algeria, which boiled over as independence grew near, endangering the future of the European settlers. In the two months after independence, around one and a half million European settlers abandoned their homes in Algeria following a series of massacres against them. You mustn't forget that hundreds of thousands of Algerians died in that war. It's fundamental. Every Algerian family was affected by the war, the cruelty, the violence, the tragedy. And the desire for vengeance existed. You can't sit back calmly when your whole family's being killed. The 150,000 Algerian Muslims who fought for France and who are still referred to as Arkis. Ahead of independence, they were forcibly disarmed by the French army who stood by as thousands were tortured and killed by Algerian independence fighters who regarded them as traitors. Unlike the European settlers, and despite the clear danger to their lives, Algerians who had fought for France were forbidden from immigrating to the former colonial power. But through the kindness of individual French commanders, several thousand were illegally smuggled into France. On arrival, they were confined to primitive rural camps. This is the site of such a camp in which these men used to live. It was finally demolished only in 1995. Following the war, the French state was quick to draw a line under it. An amnesty was put in place for all crimes committed during the war, and for decades, it was veiled in official silence. Only in 1999, and partly under pressure from the Algerian immigrant community, did the National Assembly officially admit that a war had taken place. And this small monument was erected on the banks of the River Seine. At a secret base in the Guatemalan jungle, American CIA agents had been training Cuban exiles to invade Cuba. This, they thought, would be the impetus for the Cuban people to rise up and overthrow Castro. The plan was presented to the new president, John F. Kennedy. Kennedy felt that a plan that he had inherited, under which a band of Cuban exiles were to liberate their own country, was one he could hardly turn his back on. Surely the United States uh, should help get rid of a communist dictatorship in our hemisphere. The CIA badly misled the new president, promising him an easy victory and an end to the Cuban problem. Kennedy agreed to the invasion, but demanded crucial changes to hide America's involvement. Just three days before the planned invasion, Kennedy denied any possibility of American intervention. There will not be, under any conditions, be an intervention in Cuba by United States Armed Forces. And this government will do everything it possibly can, and I think it can meet its responsibilities to make sure that there are no Americans involved in any actions inside Cuba. As Kennedy spoke, the invasion force was gathering. An advance wave of American bombers planned to destroy Castro's air force on the ground. The president, worried that this might reveal Washington's role, ordered the operation scaled down. 
On April the 15th, 1961, just six American bombers, disguised in the colors of the Cuban Air Force, took off from Nicaragua for a crucial attack on Cuban airfields. But with so few bombers, only three Cuban planes were destroyed. Seven civilians were killed. We prepared ourselves to resist an invasion against all the forces we knew the Americans had at their disposal. The following day, just 1,500 exiles, equipped with American arms and ammunition, arrived at the Bay of Pigs, 125 miles to the south of Havana. Castro's remaining air force quickly destroyed the ships carrying vital ammunition supplies. Mistakenly believing that this was a full-scale American invasion, Cuba mobilized all its forces. Without American air support or resupply, the invasion force was outnumbered and outgunned. Within 72 hours, the invaders were either captured or dead. Jack Kennedy was devastated by the fiasco at the Bay of Biggs, and he said it was a fiasco. He was not accustomed to failure in politics or in life. And he was more distraught than I'd ever seen him. How could I have been so stupid, he said. On the morning of Sunday, August 13th, Berliners woke to find a divided city. Teams of workers under armed guard started erecting a barbed wire barrier through the center. The barrier split Berlin. Families were torn apart. Three days later, concrete blocks began to replace the barbed wire. Along the sector boundaries rose the Berlin Wall, carving the city in two. In the east, people risked death to flee through the last chinks in the barrier. Where the border ran down the middle of the street, windows overlooked the west. Helping people escape became a routine assignment for West Berlin's fire brigade. Here are perhaps the most dramatic scenes ever to come out of Berlin. Tossing belongings from the window of an apartment overlooking the western border and freedom, an escapee is prepared to jump to safety into a net held by police and firemen of West Berlin. a rescue episode that is even more extraordinary. An attempt is being made by sympathetic Germans to assure the escape of a brave woman. While communist police try to pull her back through the window, below there is freedom's grip, a blood-chilling sequence that the news of the day camera follows to its dramatic conclusion.
The East Germans blocked even this last loophole. People swam lakes and canals, clung under trains, hid in cars, climbed barriers under fire. Hundreds failed, many died. Despite the human suffering, East Germany justified the wall as a bulwark of peace. Suddenly on Saturday, October 20th, the president cancels his trip and hurries from a rain-swept Chicago back to Washington. All week, reconnaissance planes have been sweeping the island of Cuba. The new intelligence photos are in, and now the evidence is unmistakable. It shows Russian IL-28 Beagle bombers capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And it shows more offensive ballistic missiles being emplaced. These are medium range. These are intermediate range. Both have nuclear strike capabilities. All of the Western Hemisphere, from Hudson Bay to Lima, Peru, is within their range. With the facts now before him, President Kennedy continues to meet with his top advisors and prepares to address the nation. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Acting therefore in the defense of our own security and of the entire Western Hemisphere, and under the authority entrusted to me by the Constitution, as endorsed by the resolution of the Congress, I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will they found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Suddenly the idea of civil defense no longer seems either useless or foolish. Suddenly, millions of Americans are asking one question. How can I make my family safe? Suddenly, it seems very important to have adequate supplies in every home. In some parts of the country, supermarket shelves are stripped bare. Yet if the worst had come, most of these second thoughts would have been too late. At the United Nations, Ambassador Stevenson takes America's case to the world. He asks Russia's ambassador, Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? <laughs> you will have your answer in due course. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. Strategic Air Command B-52 bombers, already on a massive worldwide airborne alert, are now flying 24-hour missions.
Air Defense Command interceptors and tactical air command fighter and reconnaissance aircraft join Navy, Marine, and SAC to maintain watch on the 2,000 ships known to be in the Atlantic. No one is certain how many of them are headed for Cuba with cargoes of prohibited weapons. All that is sure is that within 24 hours, a confrontation between the searching forces of the United States and a Soviet vessel heading for Cuba must take place. The world awaits the outcome. On Thursday, October 25th, the Navy intercepts the Soviet tank of Bucharest and allows her to proceed. On Friday, another encounter takes place at sea. A Soviet chartered vessel, the Marukla, is stopped, boarded, and inspected, then cleared to proceed to Cuba. The world breathes a little easier, but the crisis continues. Low level reconnaissance planes at near treetop level surprise the Cuban anti aircraft crews, catch them running for their guns, and report that work on the missile sites is still going forward at a feverish pace around the clock. The Kremlin stalls for time, but the White House makes clear that time is running out. Men and women the world over hang on the news. No one can be sure that he and his family will still be alive at this time tomorrow. On Sunday morning, a message reaches the White House from Moscow. Press Secretary Salinger announces that Chairman Khrushchev has agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba. Low-level surveillance over Cuba would verify the fact that missile sites had been dismantled. Soviet ships would be photographed carrying the missiles out of Cuba. There would be no question about the continued vigilance by America's armed forces. If any question remained, it would concern civilian Americans. Would they too remember this fateful week in October? Master Lodge came to Saigon, he let everybody know who was in charge, and he was the boss. And you better execute his orders without hesitation or murmuring, or you were out. The generals, through Konin, secretly asked Lodge for American support in their plot to topple Ziem. He needed U.S. support, but he wanted to keep control, and he wanted to keep the foreigners out. Suspecting a coup, Ziem and Yu declared martial law. Do you think that this government still has time to regain the I support do. of the people? With changes uh, in policy and uh, perhaps with, uh, in personnel, I think it can. If it doesn't uh, make those changes, I would think that the chances of winning it would not be very good. Konin had signaled his approval of the general's plan. But suspecting a double cross, the generals refused to reveal the date for the coup. It began on November 1st. And it was just a little after one when we heard the first uh, shell go off. And then we went up onto the roof and you could see the planes dropping bombs. At 3.30 on the morning of November 2nd, the generals, infantry, and tanks began their assault on the palace. Within minutes after he was killed, I, I got the word. And what... He, 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 he and his brother left the 
palace, the Jialong Palace, and went in this underground uh, passageway to this Chinese merchant's house in Sholan, the Chinese section of, of Saigon. And in the morning, they went into the uh, Roman Catholic Chinese church. And when they came out, there were armed men and an armored car, and they were pushed into the armored car and, sh I believe, shot inside the armored car. John F. Kennedy government had been complicit in Xiem's overthrow and that complicity deepened America's involvement in Southeast Asia. August 2nd, the destroyer Maddox reported it was attacked by a North Vietnamese patrol boat. It was an act of aggression against us. We were in international waters. I sent officials from the Defense Department out, and we recovered pieces of North Vietnamese shells that were clearly identified as North Vietnamese shells from the deck of the Maddox. So there was no question in my mind that it had occurred. But in any event, we didn't respond. And it was very difficult. It was difficult for the president. There were very, very senior people in uniform and out who said, my God, this president is, they didn't use the word coward, but in effect, uh, he's not protecting the national interests. Two days later, the Maddox and the Turner Joy, two destroyers, reported they were attacked. Now, where are these torpedoes coming from? Well, we don't know. Presumably from these unidentified craft. There were sonar soundings. Torpedoes had been detected. Other indications of attack from patrol boats. We spent about 10 hours that day trying to find out what in the hell had happened. At one point, the commander of the ship said, we're not certain of the attack. Another point, they said, yes, we're absolutely positive. And then finally, late in the day, Admiral Sharp said, yes, we're certain it happened. So I reported this to Johnson, and as a result, there were bombing attacks on targets in North Vietnam. Johnson said, we may have to escalate. I'm not going to do it without congressional authority. And he put forward a resolution, the language of which gave complete authority to the president to take the nation to war, the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. Now, let me go back to the August 4th attack. Well, apparently, been at least nine uh, torpedoes in the water. All missed. Yeah. No, I don't. Wait a minute. Uh, I'm not so sure about this number of, of, of engaged. Right. We'd, we'd have to check it out here. He said many of the reported contacts and torpedoes fired appear doubtful. Uh, freak weather effects on radar and overeager storm and may have accounted for many reports. Okay, well, I'll tell Mr. Nightmare this. That's the best I can give you, Dave. Sorry. 
it does appear now that uh, a lot of these torpedo attacks were from the sonar man, you see. And uh, they get keyed up to things like this. Everything they hear on the sonar is a torpedo. You're pretty sure there was a torpedo attack, though? Oh, no doubt about that, yeah. I think. No doubt about that. No, it was just confusion. And events afterwards showed that our judgment that we'd been attacked that day was wrong. It didn't happen. And the judgment that we had been attacked on August 2nd, which we'd made, was right. We had been. Although that was disputed at the time. So we're right once and, and wrong once. Ultimately, President Johnson authorized bombing in response to what he thought had been the second attack and hadn't occurred, but that's irrelevant to the point I'm making here. He authorized the attack on the assumption it had occurred and his belief that it was a conscious decision on the part of the North Vietnamese political and military leaders to escalate the conflict and an indication they would not stop short of winning. We were wrong, but we had in our minds a mindset that led to that action. And it carries such heavy costs. Correctly, or we see only half of the story at times. We see what we want to believe. We see what we, you're absolutely right. Belief and seeing, they're both often wrong. Israel's Air Force draws the Star of David over Arab horizons. It's a potent symbol of Israel's victory in just six days over three Arab armies. The Great Kurs Hatay. The date, the 5th of June 1967, and Israel launches its first wave of airstrikes, destroying 300 Egyptian military aircraft. A day later, the Gaza Strip is taken. Then the West Bank falls. From here, it's on to Egypt and the Sinai. By the 10th of June, Syria's Golan Heights is under Israeli occupation. The war only stops after Israel heeds UN warnings not to advance further into Syrian territory. In just six days, three Arab armies are crushed. The defeat destroyed the idea of pan-Arab nationalism an idea heavily pushed by Egyptian President Jamal Abdel Nasser. Arab countries had a new problem to deal with, Israeli occupation of their lands. Since 1967, it's been a history of fighting, interspersed with hopes of peace. Had accepted two states, Palestinian state and Jewish state. And a failed peace deals. In 1973, the Arabs win a limited victory. Egypt signs a peace deal that sees the Sinai returned. But since then, the frustration in the region on all sides continues. Israel has no security and the Palestinians no state. A war that lasted just six days has now been waged for 40 years. It was the deadliest attack on American ships since World War II. 34 sailors were killed aboard the USS Liberty after Israeli fighter jets fired on the Liberty during the Six-Day War back in 1967. So why don't more of us know about the story of this ship? Well, a father and son team are trying to change that. We are joined now by John Scott, who was an officer on the Liberty and a damage control engineer, and his son, James Scott, an investigative writer and the author of Attack on the Liberty. Gentlemen, thank you both for coming in today. John, I have to ask you, what was that day like? Uh, the weather was great. I had the uh, four to eight watch uh, on the bridge that morning. Got to see the first light of the day and got to spot the first observation plane that came out from Israel to fly around the ship and identify us and take back off towards Israel. And <clears throat> other than that, it was just a great day until out of the blue, we got attacked. 
And obviously, uh, many, many casualties there. The, the attack was uh, fast and furious, and it looked very much like the Israelis uh, wanted very much to sink the ship and leave no survivors, which we know in retrospect was exactly what they intended. And so there was some premium on getting an SOS out. Israeli planes are, are, are uh, strafing the deck. They're pouring napalm on the deck. And this uh, courageous guy from Texas uh, just goes out there, finds one end of the antenna, realizes that there's a cable that's been destroyed on the deck, goes back, gets some, I say, bailing wire. Uh, the commander of the Sixth Fleet uh, issued these instructions to send the, the jets, and they were sent. Now, bear in mind, uh, the casualties were severe, uh, but not as severe as they ended up being. Because most of the crew, of course, was below deck, including those from NSA or seconded to NSA who were intercepting the uh, Egyptian, Russian, and uh, uh, dare I say, and Israeli uh, uh, communications. Uh, so after Admiral Geis uh, set his uh, his fighter bombers off the, the carrier, all of a sudden he gets this uh, message from uh, uh, from Beckenmara saying, uh, call those jets back immediately. And Guy says, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, my, one of my ships is being attacked. Uh, I'm not going to do that unless I can speak to your superior officer. He said that to the <laughs> Secretary of Defense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and guess what? LBJ is on the other line. And no. He gets oh, right. Yep. And he gets right on. And he said, you call those, so you call those jets back right away. I don't want to embarrass my ally, Israel. And so Admiral Geis called the jets back. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, if those jets arrived on the scene, they would have arrived in time enough to prevent the torpedo boats, three of them, 60 tons each, from, from uh, firing their torpedoes, one of which hit the NSA uh, uh, unit there below deck, killed 25 immediately, and uh, disabled, of course, the entire uh, intercept operation. So there you have 25 people that would have been not killed, and they were added to the, well, it ended up being 34 that were killed, 174 that were uh, that were wounded, and that amounts to two-thirds, two-thirds of that crew of 294. So this was uh, an incident that was not just a paltry little thing. It was a deliberate attack. We know from the intercepts uh, between, you know, pilot to control tower, but that's an American flag. That's an American flag. Bomb it. Strafe it. Carry out your orders. Uh, these things were heard by my colleagues. I was on sort of active duty, you might say, at the CIA at the time. And I know that my colleagues heard. They must have had some real good reason to want to attack an American boat. Because just think, if the truth got out to the American people at large that Israel had committed an act of war such as this, uh, then that could cost American support for Israel over the long term. I mean, this is a major gamble they were playing. Why would, in the world, would Israel do such a thing, Ray? Why they did it? There are two uh, reasons that I give equal uh, possibility to. First one is that uh, their plan was to take the Golan Heights starting on the 9th of June. This was the 8th of June. They couldn't communicate with their forces up there in Golan Heights without the Liberty intercepting the messages. And so, what do you do? Well, if you're pretty sure that uh, the U.S. is going to have to let you off on this, you destroy the ship, you, you uh, sink all the tapes as well, and you destroy all the survivors so that uh, you can go up on the Golan and not give the U.S. the uh, opportunity to, to bang on you again and say, look, don't do it. In other words... Uh, in the Israeli frame of mind, it was better to ask for forgiveness rather than for permission. And that's precisely what they did. They went up on the Golan the next day. They didn't want us to know about it. They didn't want us to interfere with their plans. And uh, that's one explanation. Now there's another. And this is sort of gory. Uh, there is Al-Arish, which is up about a thousand prisoners. And prisoners are a real pain, you know, in Sinai. You have to feed them. You have to give them water. And it's a real pain. And so what happened here, according to Bamford and, and these eyewitnesses, 
is that Egyptian prisoners of war, there are about three or four hundred of them in the coastal town of El Arish there in the Sinai, uh, they were lined up, they dug their own graves, they were shot, and that's the way they took care of the Egyptian prisoners. Now, the Liberty is patrolling directly opposite El Arish, okay, in international waters, but with an easy, easy range to pick up the intelligence of what's going on there, okay. Line of sight, I mean, you could see the Liberty big as big as it can be right off the shore. Now, the Israelis are well aware of that, and uh, that wouldn't be terribly good PR to get back to the U.S. Yeah, it's better, it's better to commit two war crimes than one. It's better to strafe Americans, attack Americans, and strafe them in their lifeboats than slaughtering a bunch of Egyptians, which obviously Americans don't care about anyway. Yeah, well, if you, if you achieve both, then you, you, know, don't, you suppress all the evidence. And I should... uh, comment about why this is so important right now in terms of the American-Israeli rel relationship and uh, Admiral Mullen's uh, reference to the USS Liberty uh, last year when he went to Israel and so forth. Yeah. Well, um Long story short, uh, no U.S. politician has dared to breathe the word USS Liberty since 1967 until July of 2008. You got Mike Mullen, who was the chair, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and, you know, he's a pretty gutsy guy. And so he was sent to Israel uh, to tell them that uh, you know, he, they didn't want, that is, the U.S. administration, and particularly the U.S. military, they didn't want Israel mousetrapping the U.S. into a into a, a major fight with Iran. So what uh, what Mullen was hell bent and determined to prevent was the Israelis doing this last summer when it Mullen goes there and he says, "Look, if you're thinking about perpetrating a little provocation, like say, say in the Persian Gulf, don't even think of it, because you know what? We know what happened to the USS Liberty on June 8th." 1967, and it ain't going to happen again. Do you hear me? Now, <laughs> why is that gutsy? Well, it's gutsy because it's the first time any U.S. official braced the Israelis. They know that Mullen knows, not only that Mullen knows, but he's not going to happen again, okay? But, you know, if the chairman of the Joint Chiefs says, look, don't do it, this time that gives a little weight to the, uh, uh, to the warning. Mm -hmm. um, he said, the evidence was clear. Both Admiral Kidd, in charge of the investigation, and I believed with certainty that the attack was a deliberate effort to sink an American ship and murder its entire crew. Not only did the Israelis attack the ship with napalm gunfire and missiles, Israeli torpedo boats machine gunned three lifeboats that had been launched in an attempt by the crew to save the most serious wounded. That's a war crime. On August 21st, and now we can say it freely, we occupied Czechoslovakia. Ibrahim Asayev from Kazakhstan was a tank driver during the invasion of Prague. I could hear the, the planes in the air and the world shook a lot because, the, of course, the tanks were in Prague. Ivana Dolezalova was 19 years old. In the preceding months, during the Prague Spring, the Czechoslovak government, led by Communist Party head Alexander Dubček, succeeded in passing democratic reforms, widely known as socialism with a human face. To the Soviet leadership in Moscow, this was unacceptable. The ground forces entered first, and then the firing started. And then we understood that we'd landed in a meat grind. Alexander Mitko was with the 194th Airborne Regiment that flew into Czechoslovakia. Before this, we had flown to countries of Warsaw Pact, and we were welcomed everywhere. But this time, it was like, take that. You are facing at a very short distance, the soldiers who are invading your country. But what you see is faces of young, innocent boys. Uh, you see the confusion in their 
in their eyes. You see um, fear. You realize that it's not their fault that they were sent over. They told us to our faces we were occupiers. We said, how can we be occupiers if we're just carrying out our orders? What do you mean occupiers? Thousands of people gathered outside Czechoslovak radio to protect this source of uncensored news. It was clear that once they get hold of the media, um, the country might be pretty much lost. Of course, it did then turn into much more violent uh, act. Then I disappeared. I didn't want to get killed. Later in the morning, the Soviets uh, ran into the building. They did find the studio. They were on the air and uh, they stopped the broadcasting. Pavel Pechacek was a producer at Czech Radio. Then what happened, it was uh, almost a miracle. Russians didn't find small studios of Czechoslovak radio all over Prague. People destroyed names of the streets on the walls of Prague. It was difficult for Soviets to uh, really uh, know where they exactly are. They were broadcasting for a number, number of days underground. There was, though, uh, this incredible solidarity amongst people who went to the streets and who started um, basically negotiating with the Russians. There was also a little bit of fun, of course, this nation has that in its veins. We had these banners or slogans like, you know, Ivan, go home, Natasha is waiting for you, and stuff like that. Some people uh, claim that uh, Czechs and Slovaks were rather cowards, that they didn't fight. And I have to say, it's not true. In such cases, like 1968, Czechs were, I think, brave enough. After 24 days, the Russian tanks withdrew, but Moscow was back in charge. Retrospectively, I think it was inevitable, and I think it was naive to think that Brezhnev would not, would let it happen. We can say that Soviets had to come. We hoped they will not, but somewhere inside we had feelings they probably finally will, and they did. That was deceit from our part. We felt it. I was left with a bitterness in my soul. Why did they get into this? They basically hadn't done anything wrong. Thank God, those days are over. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, the Soviet-American talks on limiting nuclear arms have been deadlocked for over a year. As a result of negotiations involving the highest level of both governments, I am announcing today a significant development in breaking the deadlock. The statement that I shall now read is being issued simultaneously in Moscow and Washington. Washington, 12 o'clock, Moscow, 7 p.m. The governments of the United States and the Soviet Union, after reviewing the course of their talks on the limitation of strategic armaments, have agreed to concentrate this year on working out an agreement for the limitation of the deployment of anti-ballistic missile systems, ABMs. They have also agreed that together with concluding an agreement to limit ABMs, they will agree on certain measures with respect to the limitation of offensive strategic weapons. The two sides are taking this course in the conviction that it will create more favorable conditions for further negotiations to limit all strategic arms. These negotiations will be actively pursued. This agreement 
is a major step in breaking the stalemate on nuclear arms talks. Intensive negotiations, however, will be required to translate this understanding into a concrete agreement. This statement that I have just read expresses the commitment of the Soviet and American governments at the highest levels to achieve that goal. If we succeed, this joint statement that has been issued today may well be remembered as the beginning of a new era in which all nations will devote more of their energies and their resources, not to the weapons of war, but to the works of peace.